This is not an ordinary place. In fact, ordinariness would be an unlikely way to describe life in almost any part of Beverly Hills, California. Here, there are no next door neighbors, and the only sounds to be heard may come from an angry parrot or a playful llama. And when these distractions begin to interfere, there is always the quiet of a wooded trail. At a time when restraint is generally the order of the day, these monuments to affluence are often considered synonymous with influence. This is the house of Hugh Hefner. CBS News was invited to come here on the 20th anniversary of Look Up and Live. CBS News presents Look Up and Live. Today, pleasure and principle, the Playboy Mystique. Our moderator is Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Almost 10 years ago, CBS News explored the relationship of the Playboy to the Christian. Now, we decided to consider and reconsider the Playboy phenomena and its relationship to contemporary life. With us today to talk about just that is a leading philosopher of religion, Harvey Cox, author and professor at the Harvard Divinity School. Our other guest has been called a leading philosopher of the modern sexual revolution. And he is Hugh Marston Hefner, founder and publisher of Playboy magazine. You, Mr. Hefner, have as the center of your theology sex. And you, Mr. Cox, have as the center of yours mysticism. I think these two beliefs are in conflict or compatible. And which of them do you consider a better guide to everyday living? You want to handle that one first, or is that uh, you start? After you, Alpha. I disagree. Well, I can handle the uh, the sexual part, I guess, and uh, I'll leave the mysticism to uh, to Harvey. Uh, you know what we've tried to do in Playboy is respond to the essentially anti-sexual, anti play and pleasure aspects of our traditional religious beliefs. I think that uh, in America and in much of the rest of the world, uh, we have essentially a work-oriented ethic for reasons that we might want to probe. Uh, and that increasingly with, uh, with greater affluence and with uh, uh, technological advances and a number of the dehumanizing aspects that come with that, uh, we've moved into a position in which we're going to have to find our sense of identity in, in other things. And, um, you know, sex for me is properly understood, you know, perhaps the single greatest humanizing force on this earth. It'd be a rather sad planet if there weren't two sexes, and I think that we've managed to use and, uh, and abuse and misunderstand our sexuality which to me is, is very much related to our humanism. Do you think you have contributed to some of that confusion? There are those among us who think that the Playboy version of sexuality is increasingly irrelevant, particularly when the rest of American society strives for a more authentic sexual maturity. I think it's impossible to separate anything from the society in which it exists. So I think that to some degree Playboy is guilty of reflecting some of the more exploitive aspects of, of, uh, of sexuality in our society, but by and large, the thrust of the publication has been, I think, to humanize and to eliminate some of the repression uh, and some of the problems that exist in terms of human sexuality, both in terms of our own body and just in terms of human relationships. At least that's the intent. Let me, uh, uh, let me respond to that question now that I've had a uh, chance to think about it while I was listening to Hugh. I don't think I would say that mysticism lies at the center of my theology. You have a friend. Oh, I have a... Uh, I'd want to say that the human person, as created by God and as destined for some kind of real human fulfillment, lies at the center. And I would want to say that I think some forms of religion and mysticism have been just as badly misused in anti-human and anti-personal ways as uh, the exploitation of sex has been. Uh, I think there are some forms of uh, religion which have been and probably continue to be anti-personal, anti-human, anti-sexual. There are others that, uh, that aren't. 
I mean, it, it isn't that kind of simple standoff. Uh, at the heart of the Western religious and mystical tradition, there's a kind of respect for the earth, the flesh, the body, the kind of stuff of history. And one of the things I'm kind of concerned about today is the uh, enormous influx of uh, kind of import model of Oriental mysticism, which I think basically doesn't take seriously the flesh and the body and history, which also, I'm not talking simply about the pleasurable aspects of it. I mean, uh, human suffering uh, and human uh, indignity are, are not uh, a major interests in some forms of religion. So I don't think the discussion between Hefner and myself is a discussion between sex and mysticism. I think that puts it entirely wrong. I'd much rather talk about the misuses of religion, the misuses of, of sex, and the possible human fulfillment that both of them can uh, provide. Uh, I think that the, the, basically the playboy view of women is uh, a very questionable one. One that sees them basically as uh, accoutrements to the man, really not having have independent status and dignity and purpose and worth all of their own. And I don't think Harvey would disagree that organized religion is more to blame for that than, uh, than playboy is. But I think that the the major dehumanizing aspects of uh, uh, our, our sexuality uh, are found deep-rooted in our organized religion, in, in, in that tradition. I think Harvey would agree with that. And Playboy was among, you know, was one of the first in the last generation to really seriously respond to that. And uh, uh, I think that indeed is how um, I, I became involved in uh, much of the dialogue with, uh, with Harvey and other uh, major religious leaders. I think it is a positive contribution for anybody to have gotten to, to gotten rid of some of the Victorian uh, hangover of attitudes towards sexuality, which are certainly neither in keeping with the best of religious or humanistic philosophy. I think the question I have is when the idea of getting rid of sexual repression is presented in a form in which there is not genuine equality between men and women, it ends up as a more subtle form of uh, manipulation and misuse, uh, with a little more sheen and a little more uh, uh, pizzazz. But still, the basic question is whether men and women are, are uh, allowed to be and encouraged to be equal participants in all realms of life, including their own sexuality. And the, the objection I've had to, uh, to Playboy, uh, which I, I think probably still continues, is that I see women depicted there a little bit too close to, oh, the kind of, uh, the, the sport coat that you need this for this fall. I mean, we've really got to learn kind of habits of simplicity and uh, a, a kind of scaling down of our consumption tastes. And I, I think this is not something that, that Playboy has, has helped to teach us. If anything, it's kind of stimulated further, more, more, ta more more consumption. Mr. Hefner, do you see your philosophy as one that is directed to the affluent class, as a rather elitist and privileged hope, uh, approach uh, to life? Uh, frivolous, I hope not. Uh, no, I didn't say frivolous. I'm affluent. Sorry. Affluent? Uh, yes. Uh, but I hope with a conscience. I think that, as a matter of fact, there's a magazine that on its cover indicates that it is intended as an entertainment book primarily for men. Uh, the magazine devotes a remarkable amount of space and has for uh, most of that 20 years, particularly in the last 10, to the problems of materialism. When you talk about materialism, it seems to me or, uh, it's very closely rooted and tied in with uh, the technological advances that have taken place on this planet. And that's a mixed bag. The technological, scientific and other kinds of uh, related advances are the things that have lengthened our lives uh, by eliminating disease, have, have given us a way to reduce poverty, have given us a better way of life, but also, and we're only really becoming aware of this within the last very few years, have dealt us a, a, a series of problems which we must come uh, to grips with and have to cope with uh, within the next, you know, very few years, or it's going to be over for us on this planet. Uh, we have, I think, the technological potential now for moving into a period on the planet level uh, uh, of a real veritable renaissance, which would mean significant affluence for the world. And I think that potential is technologically there. It's just that sociologically, we're still dealing with many of our problems. 
with a kind of super nationalism and superstition that uh, is better suited for the Middle Ages. And I think that's the basic problem, and I think that, that Playboy does, within, within its own limited terms, speak out on these issues. And I think that Harvey would attest to this, is, is doing as much as most other periodicals. I think one of the reasons that he writes for us is that he, despite the seeming polarity of where we begin, we have more common grounds in terms of true mutual interests in terms of society than he would find in uh, many other magazines today. In the past, Mr. Cox has written that the magazine is anti-sexual. Do you still hold that view? Yeah, I, I, I would say that again. I know that's one of the things that Hefner uh, dislikes the, the most. Or we disagree. Well, why yeah. doesn't yeah. he respond to it? Well, let me tell you what I mean by anti-sexual. Uh, I think a, a, a relationship between a man and a woman which is authentically sexual is one between equals and people who take each other uh, as whole persons. That is, uh, a, that is, seeing a woman, let's say even merely as a play partner, although that's certainly good, that's certainly part of the relationship. But you're not confining that relationship to the entertainment recreation area that Mr. No, Hepner I'm afraid that's what it's. That, I think that's sort of what it's done, and I, uh, you know, I would like to really see. Uh, this is an entertainment magazine. And that's right. You can't expect an entertainment magazine to do everything. However, there is a there is a kind of suggestion here that one ought to be very careful about getting involved with women beyond the kind of play range. Now, I think that's exactly what almost what what adolescents think. They're, they're terrified. Adolescents of both sexes are terrified of genuine, painful, deep involvements with people of the other sex. That's a very terrifying subject. And we, we know this from the history of religion, from psychology. And, and to have it suggested that one can have that and have it in a satisfying way, simply at the level of play, I think is, is, is just well, not right. in addition right. to linking sex with upward mobility, uh, Playboy has also succeeded in portraying some women as accessories and disposable ones at that and keeping them at a safe distance. So you suggesting that as an adolescent and increasingly irrelevant view of sexuality? Yeah, I should say, however, I don't think this is Playboy's fault. I think, uh, I think there's something about American society as such and the, the kind of situation that men are put into which enormously prolongs this female-phobic adolescence. But I don't think that Playboy contributes to maturity in this respect. I think it, it helps prolong adolescence. Uh, and it's okay to be adolescent when you're 17, but when you're 43 and you're still uh, an adolescent, that, then something's a little funny. Mr. Hefner? And I think there's certain aspects of adolescence that might be best uh, retained for a lifetime, but I think that the real point here is that uh, our traditions, religious and otherwise, have, have taught us about the suffering of sexuality. That we've learned very, very well. And uh, we know about the morality of procreation and the sex uh, used for that purpose. But sex, as a pleasurable aspect of life, uh, and in that sense as a part of humanism, that is difficult to find in our religious tradition. The male-female relationship is the whole point of what Playboy is all about. It is a magazine directed primarily at the male part of the uh, adult male part of uh, the audience out there, and it is talking about heterosexual relationships. It's talking about the kind of things that can develop in a, in a uh, society between men and women. Now, I confess that we are dealing only with the beginnings of those relationships. We are dealing with a period in late adolescence and early maturity that is not concerned with uh, marriage and children and the rest of things that come in the later years. But this is a period that is all important as far as I'm concerned if that maturity is to develop later. In the world in which I was raised, no such period existed. And it was expected and understood that you went directly from school almost immediately into marriage, into raising a family and children. And it's a deadly kind of approach to life because you have no real opportunity at all to discover who you are as a human being, to discover what the rest of the world is all about, to discover, therefore, what kind of mate may be suitable for you, and, in simple truth, to give you a real chance at any kind of mature relationship with the opposite sex. Let me put in a, a, a word for some of the old traditional values, if I may do that. On, For example, I mean, I, I want to 
say I, I'm in, in complete agreement of this idea of a kind of what we used to call an identity moratorium. That if mm -hmm. you're not pushed from high, from junior high into high school, into college, into career, into marriage, I really believe that not just at adolescence, but at certain other places along the cycle, you ought to have time to try mm -hmm. other things, to get away from what you're Find doing. Find out who you are. Yeah, and, and that, uh, that isn't something that's settled just at the end of adolescence. It also comes up a little later on, as I'm sure you're finding and I'm finding. Uh, however, uh, I find among my students, for example, who are now post-adolescents or people in their early 20s, a strange kind of attraction for what some of those old values. For example, getting close enough to one person, even though you're not married to him or her, over a long period of time, rather than uh, uh, playing the field uh, incessantly. That is, there, there, you find out something about yourself by a deep relationship that you don't find out I by playing the field. There's, uh, there's an also, and this, uh, I think this is coming back to another point, a rediscovery of some of the value of simplicity. That is, of not consuming things Stripping endlessly. Away, yes. Getting back to the essentials, getting back to... Uh, uh, not owning too many things, not having too many things, or at least our most religious traditions say, these no longer contribute to our fulfillment. They start impoverishing us. At a certain point, one begins to get impoverished by that. No, things and become more important than the... Than the people. Yes. That's right. Once people don't really have to worry all the time about mm -hmm. where their next meal is mm -hmm. coming from, mm -hmm. then the really basic questions of life can be asked. What's it all about? What are we here for? Where did we come from? How do we fit into the whole scheme of things? That is the kind of the, the, the basic religious question, you might say. Therefore, However, a great I, opportunity. But though, I think, yeah. but really, though, before, before it's, a, it's a luxury to be able to ask those questions mm -hmm. because most of the people in the world are not at this stage of not having to worry about where they're going to eat tomorrow. I mean, we, we were really at a period now where, especially in this country, even the, the most advanced economists are saying, we don't know what's happening. We're in a great, we're, we're in, a, in a crisis. We can't, Famines are appearing all over the world, and the major systems that we're supposed to be able to do something about this haven't. So in a sense, we have two, two uh, games going. One is the game that we're able to play in affluent societies of asking these basic questions. But if that diverts us from an even more basic religious premise, which is I am responsible for the, for the hunger and suffering of other people, as, uh, and I have to be doing something about it, then it becomes, I think, an unwarranted luxury. I agree. So increasingly in the pages of the magazine, we became involved in not simply describing the good life, but also talking about those problems in society that, that keep that life from a major part of the population. Is your present formula a permanent one? I hope not. Again, I hope that uh, the magazine and the human being are in a continuing evolutionary stage. And where do you go from here? That's difficult to, uh, without a crystal ball, difficult to say. I don't know. What about the changes in your life, Mr. Cox? over the last 20 years? 20 years, yeah, that's a long time. I would say that I'm more, in, more interested now and more committed to certain traditional values than I was 20 years ago. When I was in the kind of, I guess at that point, in the kind of rebellion against some of them. I appreciate some of the continuities more, family life, uh, local traditions, ethnic traditions. I think sometimes that uh, we're not all that smart as we think we are in the middle of the 20th century, and there are a few things we can learn from not just previous generations, but generations many, many centuries ago. Uh, I'm, I'm, less, I'm less convinced that uh, really fast and fundamental and radical changes can occur as quickly as we, as I used to hope. I think patience is probably the thing I've learned more in the last few years. It's something I was thinking of just when, when, when Mr. Hefner was talking a moment ago. Now, it would be nice to think that if, if the religious institutions and writers and agencies didn't have to worry about sexual repression, we didn't have to spend all that time really uh, warning people and uh, how much energy would be uh -huh. released to really fire people up about hunger, uh -huh. war, nuclear, nuclear threats and all of that. I, uh, see, this is uh, kind of a little area of agreement. I think that's a good point. 
Now, I think there has How been an awful lot of energy lost oh. by... Uh, by Wasted on this silly, trivial... Yeah, on basically a very silly issue. And you see this sex, sexuality is a silly issue, but as an organizing principle of one's life. Well, sexuality <laughs> isn't a silly issue. But what we have called sexual morality in our traditional uh, system over the centuries is an exercise in triviality and you foolishness. See, you, I, th well, I think the major problem of sexuality now, really, it's, it's not the problem we had 20 years ago. When, when, I certainly when, agree with the that. The problem now is the consumerization of, of sex to the, to, the, to the obscene degree. It's not repression, really, so much. It's not kind of uh, rules against it or prohibitions. It's the degradation of sex into something you buy and pay for or something that's used to sell other things instead of having a sort of integrity of its own. Do you think that the availability of pornography, hardcore pornography, has been fostered by Playboy? I think the interest in hardcore pornography is a per perfectly healthy thing. I think that the problem with hardcore pornography is, uh, is the, much, the big to-do we make about it. Uh, it's just one, for me, one aspect of, uh, of our hang-up where sex is concerned. That aspect of sexuality, the kinds of sexuality that exist in the various media, are only a problem when we consider them a problem. Uh, it is the repression of sex that, that creates this kind of sickness. And I think that if, if, we, if we simply accepted sex as a natural and very good and positive part of, hu uh, of human life and got on to the more pressing needs of our planet, I think that we would be in far better shape. If that were really true, Playboy would be out of business. Yes, because I've heard that before. You couldn't use uh, something that's uh, totally available, about which nobody has any hang-ups, to sell every conceivable product. You couldn't, you couldn't use breasts and thighs to sell razor blades and uh, automobiles if there weren't something peculiarly wrong. So I disagree with that because I, because I don't believe that we would lose interest in breasts and thighs just because we weren't sexually oh, yeah, repressed. But you, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, read an advertisement and figure out the way to get uh, sexual satisfaction is to have the right uh, cologne. Mother love is used to sell baby powder, uh, happiness, uh, you know, running through fields and, and various... And the, we play all kinds of emotions in the, in the moving of goods and in selling other kinds of secondary things. And I think, carried to too great a degree, this is an unfortunate thing. But I think it's also a completely natural thing, as long as it has some kind of control over it. I don't think you can do that. I, I don't think you can really be the sort of prophet of liberated sexuality and at the same time use sexuality as a means for other values, some of which are pretty shoddy and pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, questionable. I, I think that the attacks on Playboy by religious people around the whole area of uh, the degradation of women are very misplaced. I, because I don't, I think that's really the pot calling the kettle black, and I really have to, I really have to take some responsibility for that. And I think it really has been basically a underlying uh, metaphysical and religious view of women in Western culture that's gotten to the point where it just won't work anymore, we, we, where we can't stand it anymore. I think the worst thing you could say about Playboy is it certainly hasn't helped. I mean, it certainly hasn't. And I don't mind it not helping if, if you don't claim it's liberating women. I'm not claiming that Playboy is a women's liberation book, but I am claiming that Playboy has been involved in what I consider a more important fundamental fight for human emancipation since the beginning of its publication and particularly within the last 10 years, and that uh, women are a major beneficiary of that. That I do believe. Well, I can't answer that because I'm not a woman. I think women have to answer that question, and I... I, I don't think many women have. By now, the arguments are familiar. But in a society that has changed so markedly, do we still need a playboy to emancipate us? We certainly do, and a good deal more. Uh, very obviously, we are a long, long ways from emancipated, and we need as many forces in society as we possibly can find to give us a more rational and humanistic society. I, I don't really think uh, people are sexually any happier 20 years after the founding of Playboy than they were before. And I don't think the people who were, have been liberated for wider sexual experiences and more of that are essentially much happier with their sexuality than they were before. And this is because I don't believe the main issue is the issue of, of conventional sex morality, but the relationship between people. And, sec and sex as a expression of a relationship which is still somehow defective, unequal, 
subordinative, dominative, and until, you see, I think the real, the really, or the real erotic breakthrough, <laughs> the real erotic breakthrough, which would really liberate sexuality, would be the real emergence of equality between men and women. As I, well, I don't disagree with that. I think that we're moving into a situation in which, uh, you know, a wider variety of lifestyles and a, and a diminishing of that male dominance is, is one of the thrusts of what is happening in society today, and I'm in favor of it. I mean, I, when I expressed that in the magazine uh, a number of years ago, I expressed it as a warning to our readers. Uh, you know, Watch uh, out, boys. Here's what's coming. That's right, because actually the, the, the major adjustment is necessary in men, not in women. And I recognize it, and uh, I recognize it in my personal life as well as in the pages of the magazine. Does that mean you're ready to move forward, perhaps a more authentic view of what life is like? Well, we continue to try and do that. Playboy is a, is a wide variety of things. Uh, intended to draw a large audience uh, but and if that large audience wasn't there it wouldn't be able to do the things that it does but playboy things also I believe pre presents a remarkably unified for, for all of its a remarkably unified image of what it takes to be a satisfied fulfilled young man in american society i agree, I agree with and, that. The good and, life is and the what the good life, life is and it does include the without question terms. the enjoyment of an affluent society yeah, I think that's the basic question. I mean, uh, not only the, uh, the enjoyment of an affluent society, but perhaps raising questions about what is the price that we have paid and that other people have paid. To but make those questions we society. do raise. The simple truth of the matter is that Playboy devotes a remarkable amount of space to raising moral questions. Ecological, racial, uh, you know, the whole spectrum of problems. Population control. But there you go again, wanting to have it both ways. I do want it both ways. I want our planet to have it both ways. I want our planet to enjoy the potential virtues of the technological advances we've made, but still do it in a rational and mature way in which we don't destroy the planet in the process. It's precisely what I want. I want the body and, man, and, and mind of man to coexist in happy cohabitation, and they have not been doing that very well on this planet for the last 2,000 years. Well, and certainly, it's your certainly one precondition yeah. for that, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. system you use, is to somehow awaken in people the recognition that our affluence is bought at the price of other people's poverty. Precisely. It, okay. it, it isn't just that we want other people to buy, share our affluence, it's that we are ripping them off. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what I don't see very much of in, in Playboy magazine. Now, I don't know what to say to that, because it's certainly there. The primary problems of overpopulation, of uh, uh, ecological abuse, of, you know, all the major problems on this planet existed 20 years ago, but we were blind to them. And I think that Playboy has been one of the voices that has heralded a recognition of these problems, while also discussing the positive aspects of enjoying an affluent society that is potentially available to us all. I, I just don't think there's, there's enough, there are enough resources in the world for everybody to live the way the guy pictured in the kind of man who reads Playboy can live. There just isn't enough. And there'll never be enough. So maybe the question is, how do we share what we have and how do we learn not only to live on less because it's, it's uh, somehow more sacrificial, but somehow there are genuine human values that make you a better, deeper, more fulfilled person if, you, if you're living more simply. That's a possibility, you know. It's, right? it's a possibility that I agree with. Uh, CBS News has presented Look Up and Live. Today, Pleasure and Principle, the Playboy Mystique. Step ...towards making it a better life for all those who do live here. Uh, these things are quite possible, and, it, and that's what I meant by, when I expressed earlier, a, a number of our superstitious attitudes, uh, and for me, irrational attitudes that get in the way of fully enjoying the affluence that is available on this society, uh, on this planet.